Hi, my name is Gina Harris, and I was born in Sacramento, California. I currently live in San Francisco, California, and I'm a singer, songwriter, and performer. I'm a vocal coach, and 12 hours a week, I'm on a suicide hotline. Welcome, Gina. It is so nice to meet you. So nice to be with you. Thank you for joining me. Oh, it's so my pleasure, Patrick. I love your podcast. Oh, I thank you. I really appreciate that so much. Yeah, you reached out to me and then I started kind of Googling you, looking you up and, and it was so, it's really just so interesting. I meet people like you just from unique, different points of view, points of backgrounds and experiences. And it it really does show me with every one of these interviews, just the different ways that people come into this business, the different ways we express our artistry. So and keep going and find ways yeah. to keep going. And they keep finding ways to try to stop us. And we keep going. <laughs> right? Which That's why I love your podcast always ends with hope. And that's what I love, because that's what I'm about too. Thank you. I, well, I'm, I'm glad that you're getting the point of it. Good. I'm glad you're getting the message. Well, I want to dive right into the first story that you wanted to share. And this was during a, a few years span of when your parents passed away. You had a voice teacher who passed away, and, and, and you say she was like a mother to you. Oh, and, yes. And at this point, it, 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 after s such a succession of, of people passing away, it was like your life was over. You know, you didn't want to do anything and, and much less perform anymore. Now, obviously, the grieving process is different for everyone. So what was it specifically that made you question everything, especially performing after all these people you were losing? Well... I want to say first that I'm not special and I'm not necessarily interesting. I just, it was like, and I say this in my music, that it was like when they died, all of their memories dimmed with them. And I couldn't access them anymore. It was like I was in this hole and it was like I was gone. They were gone, and then I was gone. And then to kind of add to it in a material way, I had to sell my parents' home because I wasn't going to go back to live in Sacramento. And so my childhood home, because it was this old rambling home in, in downtown San, uh, Sacramento, old, old, you know, part of Sacramento, 5,000 square feet home for the three of us. And so at the, my home... My childhood home was like a friend to me, and that was gone. And my childhood memories in that world were gone. And everything just went dimmed or went, really went dark. And I felt I didn't, I was a working uh, jazz performer, um, theatrical and jazz performer, and I just went dark. I just thought, I can't do this anymore. There's like, my parents, I was taking care of both of my parents and then Lillian, that's my singing teacher, like they were my children. And I was a mother who lost her children. And then I was also, I remember the night my mother died, I looked in the mirror and I thought, it's over, my job died. Because they, were, they required a lot of care. How long had you been taking care of them? Years and years and years. Um, six, six, I mean, my father started really not being great. I was trying to get him help for 17 years. But I would say that he finally went into dementia and really lost. He had very, very bad back and kind of climbed into bed, I'd say six years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Were, were your parents able to stay in the home or did they have to go yes. into nursing no, care? No, okay. my, mother, my mother took care of my father until she couldn't stand up straight. And I was the only one she allowed in and I was my parents' closest companion. And then with Lillian, um, she got dementia as well, which was a big blow to a lot of us. But when I noticed she couldn't really do her book anymore, I thought, oh, good, I'm your secretary. I'm going to do it. And then finally, as a year was a several years with Lillian as well, four or five years with Lillian, um, I, uh, I made sure every day that she taught because she could not be able to speak. And then she would get in a lesson and she would do it. And so I know that every day for at least one hour, she remembered she was a teacher. And so that was big. 
It's that always was... so interesting when I hear stories about dementia or Alzheimer's that they're, 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 they're gone. You know, that they don't know who they are or who's talking to them. What's your name? And then all of a sudden they hear a song or something triggers and then they're lucid. They're with you. They're present. Their, their memories are coming back. They're, it's, it's she was a, able to instruct. Yeah. It's really amazing how once something is, is a part of us, is a purpose and a passion within us, that even dementia and Alzheimer's can't often take it away. Especially music. I think it's in a part of the brain, but absolutely. I think any kind of performing or, or arts is sort of tucked there anyway. So with so. you, with these people passing away, and as you were saying, a, a part of you was going away, it was dimming. Did you find that your music, your singing, d did it help you? Did you find that your art was a, a crutch or, or something for you to lean on? Not until my mother came to me in a dream. So that may be another part of the, our, our, the, our conversation. But yep. uh, for some time, I, I didn't have the energy. I couldn't access myself. I couldn't, I just couldn't remember who I was. And so I just was in like a dream state for some time. I mean, I did go to the clubs and I did perform, you know, because I had commitments. But, and that certainly was something to look forward to. I mean, I would sort of sleep all day and then just perform at night. And like, that mm -hmm. was my couple of four hours of being alive for the people who had paid to come hear me and the trio and all that. Um, so that, in other words, that I am answering yes to that. But in real ways, I was catatonic. Because I mean, it sounds some... like the, the music was able to, to feed through you to others, but it didn't necessarily feed your soul, is right. what it sounds like. Right. Yeah. I was able to perform it, um, yeah, because it was a responsibility to the club and the, uh, the people. Yeah. And your parents, as you say, they, they were like your children. So they had become a purpose for you. And now with them gone, their your purpose was gone, right? You bet. You bet. And then Lillian too. You. Yeah. What and, was it about Lillian that was, that was like a mother to you? What, what was it about her that, that sparked that within? I remember my therapist once saying, you got more mothering from Lillian in one week than you did for your, you know, um, she just was, she was an amazing vocal coach, so to speak. Um, she had, she said, your body knows what to do. Get out of the way. My first time with her, I, I someone had given me her name and I went, oh, another vocal, really? Because I've been through many of them and they always liked my voice and all that because I have a high range, I have good range and blah, blah, blah. And rich, whatever. And so uh, I thought, oh, another one who can help me find. But then I got so desperate. We, I was in an acapella kind of class and we had a performance we were doing that old song um uh, 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 that seal song the rose ba, 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 yeah, yeah ba, kiss ba, from ba, a rose yeah that's it we we're singing and i was getting like hoarse and so i finally got desperate enough that i went to this woman lily and lauren in the berkeley hills you know whatever i walked in and she was the most beautiful woman i'd ever seen absolutely she was probably in her 70s at the time she was absolutely beautiful gorgeous and i walked in and i and i sang for her and i said i don't know lillian when i sing sometimes i i, I get hoarse and she said well of course darling you're hollering <laughs> and it was like and that, that was she was in that moment she was the teacher for me she told it like it was she said you have a lovely instrument blah, 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 blah. let's access it blah. and she just no time for fear no time for, and if I got upset, she'd go, stop that. Now, come on, let's do, and she was just uh, the hey. best. Yeah, it's like, a, it's, it's like a spark, a connection. Whenever you find that someone who's on your same page, your same wavelength, and they, they can speak directly to you, and it's like you hear it in a way that no one else was able to say it. Right? I mean, darling, you're hollering. I was like, oh, wow, this is the teacher for me. She told me like it is, and then she got me out of hollering. Jeez, yeah, because I, I'm I'm with a, a new voice teacher myself because my previous voice teacher, it sounds like she went through some of the things that she that you've gone through. She's lost a lot of family that mm. that are getting older, and so as as she gets older, they're <laughs> you know mm. they're kind of leading the way, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she hasn't taught for a while. So I've gone with a new teacher, and 
There was one thing we were approaching a certain note that, you know, a certain vowel that's always given me trouble. And he just said, why don't you try this? I went, how in 20 years have I never thought of that? Well, okay. and Lily would always say they never, they don't have, they don't teach the bird to sing. The bird doesn't need a lesson. The body knows what to do. Get out of your way. Tell this, tell the story, you know, open yourself up to the story you're telling, the words. She said, sing because you love it and we will too. And that's the kind of woman she was. It's just, she was right there. Like, sounds like your teacher, full of ideas. Yeah, let's, you know, I said, why did, no, I never did any vocalese. She said, well, I said, why don't you? She goes, oh, darling, you'll just work too hard. And, and, um, and I said, why do you give it to some other people? And she said, oh, to help them relax. You don't need to warm up. You're fine. Yeah. You know how to, work. you have a, have a lovely voice. Don't worry about it. Just stop thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, because there is no one approach to the voice, to the to the artistry that was, is within us. Yeah, whatever makes you relax and be who you are, and the lovely guy you are, so handsome and fabulous, and you get out there and you have this great, probably baritone, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. and and you're just right there, and you're and there's nothing that would stop you. Or your parents supportive of your singing career? Um, my mother, my mother and I had the same talking voice. In fact, I remember once my cat, she came over, my cat was going, looking up at her, looking up at me and saying, wait, where's my mom? You know, we had, <laughs> she couldn't carry a tune. So she was a little, I got the voice, but she, you know, she couldn't keep. So there was a little bit of, a little bit of an edge there, but okay. you know, uh, my mother always said, Jeannie, you're much better with people than I am. You're much better. You're much better in public than I am. And she was right. My dad had a lovely voice. And my mother used to say, your father and you should have a guitar and sing together. I bet you'd be great in Memphis. <laughs> what do they watch country? Like Don Williams, Memphis or, Nights or something. Right, I don't know, or something. Grand Ole Opry, that kind that's of thing. That's it. Yeah. She said, oh, that's what you should do, Gina. I was like, oh, that kill me first. But okay. <laughs> I, I, I take it the country and that time of folk singing was not your, your well, jam. Not at the time. I mean, I, I, my, fa my father had such a feeling for someone like Don Williams who had a low kind of the bear, honey bear kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, so that has a certain, I have a certain fondness. He grew up in Tucson. So there was all that kind of wild west in him. No, I was much, always much more theater or, and then jazz, much more of those. Now, speaking of theater, you, you were performing on stage, you know, you obviously music was what you really loved and you, you got to sing, but you were also on stage as an actress and you eventually did make your way to New York and made your Broadway debut. Now this For was a not, minute and a half. Right, right. This was <laughs> night. This was 1984 and it was Shut a up, show yes. by Peter Ustinov, Beethoven's 10th. I, I'm not familiar with the show. Why would you be? It's hardly in Wikipedia, I don't think. Um, it was a, I was terrible in a German show. I mean, I don't know. Um, I was 28. What did I know? But um, it was a show that Peter wrote and no one directed. Um, and he wrote and starred in. And it was a star vehicle for him. He was uh, as if Beethoven came back as a marriage counselor and family counselor for a um, why, um, uh, uh, George Rose played the uh, father on Broadway. Uh, Fritz Weaver had played it, played it um, uh, on the road. And then um, mother, father, um, then, he, then Adam Redfield, Red, Redfield, Redfield, I think, played the son. Um, and I was Imgard Tiefenbrunner, the Austrian au pair girl. So I had So is very, everyone in an Austrian accent? No, I just. Just Gina. I was just, 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 uh, I was an Austrian au pair girl, yeah. My accent's a little rusty. Sorry about it, Patrick. But uh, for the time, we had to do kind of an f such German accent because Austrian was just too weird, to, you know. Yeah. So I did that. And I never had a director. And Peter would say, darling, just, just, you know, the whole what play is your stage. I went, yeah, you asshole. There was 300 people in the audience, 600. I'm supposed to make an acting choice that might shine. And you, and you, and that. that. But anyway, he was, he was a nice man. Um, but when he didn't get a Tony nomination, we were off. I think it was a couple of weeks, like you said, on Broadway. Like, blink an eye, you would have missed me. Yeah, it only lasted about three weeks or so. But, but, but you did get to perform it a while because it went on yeah. tour before yeah, that. I'll, 11 months. Yeah, we, we went through every, all through everywhere. We were following 
there was something, a Jerry Herman show called Jerry's Girls. And right. we would, we followed them along everywhere in the, everywhere in the Midwest and South and Northeast. So how did a, uh, a singing girl from California, how did you find your way to this tour and eventually to Broadway? You know, my agent just sent me in. I mean, I was doing, I was doing some TV and um, he knew that I had done, I was uh, in the Groundlings. Uh, they had kind of, I was in their their classes and they invited me to the B company. So I was kind of in all that world. So I had stage in me and he thought, you know, this is, I don't know how, he didn't have that many stage actresses that he represented and he just set me up for it. And, and the, what happened was it started out somewhere else. I can't remember where, but the woman who played this character, Irm um, was a bitch. And so she got it to, got herself to LA and said, hasta la vista, baby. So they had to recast in LA. Or Ah, wie das sein? Ja, ja. That's like, well, da, da. Ah, wie das sein, da, da, da. She just, we, oh, yeah, she's gone. I haven't known whatever happened to her, but yeah. I took her role, please. Yeah. So did you ever want to go back to Broadway, or did it kind of taint your experience being in such a bad show? It just never came up again, because then I started doing some TV and then do, doing more singing, and I wasn't in New York. I was doing a lot of commercials and stuff. Um, because at the time I was blonde and, and all of this stuff. And, and I just thought, I don't, I know I went to this one audition. This is, I shouldn't be telling, I'll tell you this. Anyway. You can cut this out later. No, go um, for it. But, but I was in this audition and you know how you're in New York. I'm sure you do. Everyone does commercials in New York. And, um, I was there with, you know, 20 people who looked just like me, blonde hair, blue eyes, whatever. And I was in for young zany mom or something. They, you know, they, those mothers on those commercials are 16 years old. Anyway, I was in that. And all that, it was like one of these, you know, what am I going to do? I, I wish I had bear, you know, it was one of those commercials and where you're kind of, you know, and nothing going on in behind the eyes. And I, we're all there. And, and I'm like, I looked around and all the women were actually that character. They all were like, hi, well, how are the kids? I was the cool one. And I thought, I'm going to turn into this woman if I stay in New York any longer. I'm just going to turn into this woman. I bet I need to leave. So I left New York and I kind of never went back because I got found a career in L.A. and then San Francisco. That's so interesting that you would leave New York just because you don't like the people you're auditioning with. It's like, I don't want to no, become that. I'm going to become that. I just thought, well, that's where I was getting old. I mean, I was going out for theatrical, but you know how hard it is, you know, whatever. No, what, it was uh, it was German roles over and over again, and you know, because it was whatever. Oh, you know, oh, you know, you only can do it. No, I'm Kath from California. I don't need it. Well, no, just German accents. And then I thought I'm just going to turn into these commercial a commercial woman. No, I can't do that. So, so I, I assume your move to California was was good. It was the right choice for you. It was the right choice. I mean, you know, it would have been a different life. Who knows? Road not taken. But I got into improv and comedy, and then TV, some stuff, and then more and more singing, and then. And then, you know, all that, so. Well, the second story that you wanted to share, this leads us into kind of the current path that you've been on for a few years now. And mm -hmm. your mother had passed away three months before, and she comes to you in a dream. And she told you that everything was going to be all right. You should start writing songs about your experiences. Now, what was it that made this particular dream seem meaningful, you know, as opposed to any other dream we have at night? Imagine you've got the opportunity when you can't really remember anything, because I'm in the middle of that fugue state, you know, after. Imagine, and the house is sold. The sold, house sold right away, because it was a great house. Imagine you get to go back into your childhood home and it's on picture the perfect Saturday and the light is filtered and beautiful and you or I felt so soft and free and I went up, walked up these perfect stairs in this perfect house and there my mom was and we had tea together. And we were like we had never been before. Soft and sweet. I mean, I mean, mothers and their daughters, you know, uh, there's always tension, et cetera. But I mean, we, we had a good relationship, mom and I, and I was, 
I love you, mommy, was the last thing she heard because of before she died. So there's a lot of good there. But there's a way that we, we both could release. And I turned to her in a way I never would have in life been able to then, especially. I said, mom, this meeting here, it was like, it was like, were, was this dream, this place, this house, this neighborhood, was it away from the rest of the world? So the rest of the world was gone or, or were we gone and the rest of the world was, I don't know what, but it was perfect, a perfect island of incredible mist and wonder. I turned to my mom and I said, being here like this with you means the world to me, but I'm so worried that it will never happen again. And she took a piece of paper like this, um, that white computer paper we all have, and she took it and she tore it. And do you know, have you ever seen a magician have something called flash paper? The flames right. are there in a minute and they go away like that. She put it in, it was like flash paper. And I said, it's magic. She goes, it means the world to me too. It's magic. And I realized later, and she, she said, it's all going to be okay. You're going through this. It's normal. She normalized and she mothered like she had never mothered. I mean, I don't mean, no, this is no sub today. Actually, today is her birthday. Happy birthday, Ma. Uh, it, it's not like she wasn't a good mother. It's not that. But she mothered in a way, she was free to mother in a way that she couldn't, hadn't been able to, let's just say. Or I didn't notice, but I think she. And then I, I woke up and I was free. I was just free. And she said, it's okay. Write songs about what you've been through. And if you want to remember your father, write songs and me write songs and I didn't. I started writing songs and they were with me and they were alive. And every time I worked on the song, it was like the pain of having them gone was bridged. And I it's, woke up and I wrote the title song, which is The Magic of Ordinary Things. That's the title song of my album on my show. And it sounds like these songs were really a way to reconnect with her again because you had felt so distant from her, right? This is from all of that, but yes, her dad, my house, uh, my, you know, all of it. Was it tough writing about it or, or did it almost feel cathartic? Like ugh. blissful. It was blissful. It was wonderful. It was amazing. It was freeing and fresh and lively. And I could, I remembered things. I remembered things I hadn't even remembered before. <laughs> A door opened, Patrick. Really? Yeah, it just flooded out of you, is what it sounds like. Yes. Mm. And so I imagine that these songs have become very precious to you since they, yep. they, they hold such a, a, a memory. Yes. Every time I sing them, my, yeah. my family's with me. Mm. So uh, what happened was they were so alive and fresh and real for me um, that I in my jazz gigs, which is in a, right, you're in a jazz club, right? Picture this. And there's, you know, manitos being shaken and everyone's there to have a good Saturday night. My things were always on Saturday night and everyone's loud and raucous and the cappuccino, the cappuccino machines and everything's going. And I have these very wonderful, soulful ballads. Most of them are ballads. Some of them have a little bit of bossa beat. One of them's a blues. There's a gospel in there, but still they're pretty quiet songs. And suddenly Everyone stopped and the machine stopped and the clinking stopped. And I turned those jazz clubs every Saturday night for part of it into a listening room. And I didn't do it for any, I sang these songs for me because I got to be, as you know, you know, your voice, you live with your, you, 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 you center so much of what you do. Your voice is magic. And, and, and when I say my mother's name, Rita, when I say Lily, when I say Saul, they're alive for me in that moment. And those songs, they're alive. And people would come up to me. They'd say, I haven't thought, thought of my father in 10 years. Thank you. You know, people just got it. And then the songs said, okay, I was in New York once and I just done the blues. I have a song called I Took a Train. It's about going back to my childhood home and having not, have you been back? Nothing's the same. 
right? And there was a, yeah, a secret garden. I swear to you, on, the, on my life, Patrick, there was a secret garden with a beautiful, amazing swing set that we would go to. And I don't know who lived in the house. No one ever stopped this. It went on for years. And I was back there in this time out of this crazy time of writing the songs, or crazy, wonderful time. Um, and I went back and you, I parted and it wasn't like, oh, the yard's gone now or the other yard's different or planted differently. There's no, there was no yard. There was no house. It's like, what happened? What happened? So crazy. And so I wrote this song. I took a train to try to go home to feel it again. And that whole blues, and I just sung it in New York. And you know how New York can be. But people loved it. They loved it. Plus a song called um, The Love Song No One Wants to Hear, which is the love song to my husband which no one wants to hear me. I've been married 22 years realizing I love my husband. I mean, no, one, that's not sexy, right? That's just not sexy. So I, I have these songs and I just sung them and, and I was on a high because it was New York and they were like, yeah, and people of all ages, young, whatever. And I was walking home and the songs literally tap. I almost turned around. They tapped me and they said, by the way, we're a show. What? No, no, we're, we're a show. I said, what? I wrote them here and there. And there. Hey, get me a show. Yeah, we're a show. You need to work on it. Hmm. Call us later. And that was that whole thing. So anyway. So, so yeah, you, you'd have these just one-off songs, basically. They were just yeah. kind of by themselves. And then yeah. all of a sudden, it comes to you. It's like, no. It doesn't come to me. They they Patrick, came I to am you. not lying to you. I don't. I, I, I believe. All I, we go back. We go back for minutes and minutes here. <laughs> right. I we you know yeah yeah they just said we are a show. It was so clear. Like I literally almost turned around to who talked to me. Yeah. Because what's so interesting is that before this you hadn't really written before, right? I never you written have... a song before. I never right. written a song. I didn't go to songwriting school. I woke up. And my mother told me to. I thought, okay, I got to do it. I and... don't know how. It's amazing. It really is amazing. And have you, since then, have you been able to write things that are away from, you know, those memories and your parents and everything? Absolutely. I've written uh, another handful of songs um, and uh, they're about my life now and people I've known. And, you know, I still work with my dreams. Uh, a lot of stuff comes from my dreams. Um, and I go to my, what I call my inner self. And I ask her for help and we work together. So it's whatever is floating between us, I write about. Yeah. And even, you know, wherever our inspiration comes from, you know, we, we all have our own uh, uh, path to that inspiration. Or sometimes it comes to us, as, as in your case, it found yeah. you. And even still, no matter where inspiration comes from, there's, there's a rewriting process. And you've had to go through this rewriting process many times as you formulated the show, right? Oh my God, oh my God. So what I do is I take, I remember once, I wish I had it with me here. It's over on the other side of the room. But I remember once on an airplane, I, I was taking, I was writing the song to my father because I wasn't at my father's deathbed because I didn't listen to the voice that said inside said, are you sure your father's going to last three weeks while you go on this vacation you don't care about? Okay. So, and then five days later, he was dead. So I was just like beside myself. Mm. And I wrote, I, I had, it was, I'm, you can't see it on, because this is a podcast, but I have my, about an inch or more thick a folder. And I'm working, I'm just writing and writing and writing and writing, all, getting it all out. I have to get it all out. That's what I do. And this, I remember the flight attendant came up to me and said, well, what are you working on there? I said, a song. And she said, that many pages? I went, and I'm not done. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I write and write and write and write and write. And then I write something terrible. And then I'm bewildered because I don't know what to do. This is the bewildered phase. And then I write something terrible that rhymes too much because I'm a rhyming machine. One of the things I did in improv was song improv. So I'm a rhyming machine. Mm -hmm. And so then I write stuff that rhyme, that's stupid or rhymes too much. And then I put it away. And then I have this amazing therapist, I swear to God, and he is my undisclosed, except I'm disclosing it now, writing partner. And he'll say, oh, that's just terrible. Or, wow, that's great. You know, so he really helps me. I think you're thinking, and he knows me. And he, he's working, like, he always says, I'm working on these songs because they are the vehicle to help you. I don't care about songs. I care about you. 
And I said, yes, I care about me too, but I also want songs. He said, that's fine with me. <laughs> but, right. But, you know, two birds with one stone. Absolutely. Why two, not? Right. Two birds with one song. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. We got time. <laughs> so, yeah. So we're working. Um, and so he really, and that's why I'm really my mother director I finally worked with. He would just give me, I say, give me criticism. I'm so used to Bob, my wonderful Bob, sir, giving me like, oh, that's, oh, that's no. I, I'm just so no bones about it, no like sugarcoating it. So like I could, I'm like a rare performer. I can totally take criticism. I go, okay, and I'll take the nugget of truth or whatever it is. So we go through that back and forth. And then I, if I feel, and this takes a while, depending, iterations, you know, various times through. And then finally, when I feel like privileged to sing this song that I couldn't possibly have written, then I put it to music. And I, I, this time, Lillian, for the first couple of songs, she was there, right? <sighs> so she got to see her couple of them. Um, and so, in fact, she's the one who heard the dream who said, this is a song. And I said, of course, my mother told me to. She goes, I told you. So anyway, I said, well, how do I write a melody? I've never, I mean, I'm a, I've written things in the past sketches or whatever and writing, you know, advertise a copy to make money, whatever. She said, all you have to do it's really simple. You know what you mean. You know what you're saying. You say it in rhythm and a melody will come. Gosh darn it, she's right. So I have the words and I say them in rhythm. Then I normally have a kind of inspiration of one thing or another. And it comes. And the melody is the most joyous part. Yeah, yeah, because but I do think that, that that's so important, and I, and I think songwriters in in general that I think that these are the really skillful ones, the ones that that really find those songs that touch all of us is when those words, that story, is central, and the music just heightens it and brings it someplace else. Absolutely, you've hit the nail on the head, and you must be musical. Um. Um, and then I work with a wonderful arranger who helps me under with my direction. He helps me arrange the song. So he does mm -hmm. the uh, harmony and stuff with me. I'll say, no, don't do that. More darker, weirder. Oh, no, better, lighter. You know, whatever it is. So we come up. Now, with these songs being so personal of, about your family, about your parents, did you ever feel precious about it? Or were you able to really adjust it and change it and, oh. and not feel so tied to this word or that word? Bob knocked it out of me so fast. You know what they say, kill your darlings. Mm -hmm. You, you got it. And the ones, I mean, there are, there's this one line in this most recent song I wrote. There's this one line that I thought, honestly, Patrick was really good. But I had to throw it away because it just didn't work in the song. So it's, it's kind of not up to me. It's up to my inner self. And she, and I don't, I'm not like a vessel, so a precious vessel, you know, but really I'm, I'm taking directions. I'm taking directions. I mean, that sounds sort of highfalutin, but that's kind of how we feel. Well, I mean, it, it's it's being connected to ourselves, and I think that too often I know that for me, right now, I'm in a process. You know, I'm I'm in my own therapy, trying to figure out myself. Where am I going? What am I doing? Who am I in this world right now? We're you know, trying to really sort out both myself as an artist, as an individual, and I think when we can get to that point where we are with ourselves, where we are a companion to ourself and not and not fighting ourselves and not questioning and confused you know once when you can get to that point i think that helps us all whether we're writing songs or whether we're just trying to stay married or whether we're you know <laughs> performing on stage whatever it is you know having ourselves as a partner just helps so much well it's freeing you know and so i have to work on the song until I feel, like I said, privileged. Like, it's like, wow, I get to sing that? I get to say that? That is so hip, you know? And, and I, I, I feel free, yeah. Yeah, that's how it is. Well, this leads us into the third story, and and this one is is so true to all of us that, you know, we're, 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 at, the, we're at the end of our rope. We're kind of, 
were, were kind of burned out. And you had felt this because you had gone through so many directors there in San Francisco for, for your show. You, you had just gone after one, after the other, after the other. And, and they, they all expressed interest in doing your show, right? But they had their own ideas of what they wanted the show to be and who you should be and how you should say, you know, they had all that. But I'm guessing all of these directors, they just did not mesh with you and your vision, right? Well, I, I would say it's like... They, it's so, it's so much more about them than me. You know, like the first director, I thought I hadn't done it because he was known for doing solo shows and all this stuff. And I thought I had just, I thought I was done. I found one of, and then he just wanted me to do a family psychodrama. He didn't like it unless I burst into tears during the perform the rehearsal. And I thought, no, you know, then I went through several people who wanted me to do more cabaret shows and that that you know, like one guy had this idea of uh, every song came from an object. And uh, so uh, there are 10 pedestals on stage. I'm like, well, okay, great. But can I move around with 10 pedestals? <laughs> you know, another one said, oh, these are all conclusion songs. Oh, you have to have a lot of theater. You're not going to have time for, you know, to, to two of those conclusion songs. And then a couple of the other ones were um, really expensive, like $300 an hour. And it was... <laughs> And mm -hmm. then um, one weekend, I, I then I found the John Luguizamo. John Luguizamo. I always had trouble with his name. John Luguizamo. His show Freak, his one man show Freak. It's right. great, great, great. And he's talking to the audience, and he's setting up the scenes, and he's all the characters, and then he's and move. And I thought this is my show. So I wrote something like that, up, even though it was messy. And um, I had four. I had four. I I had committed to a. I had committed at the beginning of this, I, th I had a year. I was going to be one of the highlights. They liked my concept at the, uh, let's, re let's reimagine end of life. It's a great reimagine. It's a wonderful uh, organization. They're trying to just embrace all of life and take the taboo to death and all this kind of stuff. It's wonderful. Growth through trauma. It's wonderful. And I was going to be one there. And I, oh, I had a year to do it. And then I'm getting like six months in and I'm in my, my fifth director who's given me nothing. And so I thought I got a, I said I had a weekend of four performances. I just performed it for the people, let like just immersion. And one loved it. Oh, she loved it. Oh my God, no ideas. Second one hated it. She'd helped me stage it, but she hated it. Why would I want her? Third one, I don't even remember. Fourth one, I left. And so I'm there, all these nine directors, I'm, I'm in April and I've got to have a, a show that's not only written, but perfected, lit, sound all at the F in September. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, and the, the things have put it up. So I got to do it. Oh my God. Oh my <laughs> God. In. Yeah. I was locked in. Ah! So, <laughs> so I had gone through nine directors in like six months. So I, I didn't know what to do and I had no more people. And then I had this one over the transom, this one person said, you know, this guy's kind of good. And I did some research on him and he had just done Actually, immersion theater. Did are you old enough to have known the show Tony and Tina's Wedding? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it yeah, was an it, immersion. It played off like, Broadway here for a bit for a long time, right? Yeah, and so it was one of those things uh, where the audience is part of the show, and you can go room to room, and you can follow whatever storyline you want to follow, go back multiple times, whatever. It was in San Francisco. It was a speakeasy, and you had to meet someone somewhere. Joe sent me, and you get taken to the thing and get it buy a drink, and you could follow. It's thirty actors. And he coordinated 30 actors simultaneous. I thought, well, okay, he can at least work with actors, although I'm just one, you know, whatever. So it may be interesting. So we had a nice talk. He really wanted to talk to me and we seemed to get a little okay. And then he came on. I did the same, perform my 10 songs with my John Lucasalo kind of ersatz thing that I put together. And I did it. And this is my 10th director and it's late April and holy heck. And I sat there. And he paused for a long time and he took a deep breath and he said, there's no show here. Brilliant. Brilliant. And I said, <laughs> oh my gosh. And then I just, I'm, I was so shell shocked. So, so, of so, course, so shell shocked. Of course. Right. So many directors. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> and so I said, okay. And he said, well, well, maybe, maybe you have something with Lillian. Because you, her character, you just have immediately, and I mean, well, I had the less least fraught relationship with her, you know, doing my mother, doing my father, Lillian, much cleaner, you know. So anyway, he said maybe 
you could do Lily, and I'm thinking, well, could I do Lily? And then I could do flashbacks and do a couple of mom songs and the dad song. I don't know. So we kind of said, why don't you think about it as a Lillian show with maybe other things me? And I went and I dreamt and I talked with my inner self and she said, no. And I emailed him and I said, well, no, there is a story here with my mother and my father and me and my house and my childhood. Everyone has childhoods. Everyone's lost something. Everyone will lose someone or at some time. It's a grandmother when they're young or it's their husband or whatever, sibling, whatever it is. And there is a story here. I know there is. And I honor my parents and I will do it. So it doesn't, if you don't want to be part of it, not a problem, but thank you. And he said, you have such passion. Let's do it. And, and so because you said lot. no to him, then he said yes to you. Interesting. And then, and then. Well, I just, yes, I said, no, no, but yes. Kind of. I mean, I wasn't <laughs> icky, but I just said, look, no worries. It's just, I know there's something here. He said, I hear your passion. So for the next couple of months, he went, came twice a week. And I had written so many different things with so many different directors. I had monologues, I had scenes that people liked or didn't like. And, and so he'd say, well, there's something here. He'd always represent the audience. And, he, oh, and I had two things that another, one of the other many people had taught me, which was, um, what's at stake? You know, will it happen? Won't it happen? Whatever. And then always have sound be really play a major role because when there's one actor, the sound can be your other character. And the third mm -hmm. thing was when you can show, shove, don't tell, show, don't tell. So I had these soundscapes, which are really pretty cool. They were especially in the podcast. They're cool because they're even more because you have no visual and you know, all this stuff. And, and, and every time I'd say, well, this monologue that this director hated. And he went, oh my God, that's great. You know, and then I would improv. And at one point I put myself on trial as a daughter. He said, well, we need to, the audience is the hater. This is the bottom of the show. What are we going to do? And I said, well, I could put myself on trial as a daughter. He went, perfect. You know, so we just did it. And I, we, gosh, darn our sweet souls. We got it ready. And it was up at a hit in September. Yeah, you, you got it done. Well, I'm I'm so curious during this year time because you know much like the rewrites that we were talking about earlier, going through these directors, did did you start to to doubt yourself? Did you feel like oh maybe there isn't something here? Did you ever feel that? That's why God made white wine. No, I I just I <laughs> yes I was in shell shock. Um, and I was working with of course Bob is my therapist and he is fabulous. He's like a teacher, fabulous, amazing guy. And I would, he said, well, we had to, we need to have you work. We have to pat you into shape after some of these. You know, when the director said these are all conclusion songs and you're going to have to have a lot of theater before you can get to that kind of conclusion. Or when I had another idea where a ghost came back, it's not the show now, but a ghost came back and a director said, and I had her eating chocolate, a chocolate cupcake and loving it because she had loved it in a past life. It's not in the show now, but it was a, an idea at the time. And he said, oh, no. Oh, no, ghosts don't eat chocolate. <laughs> what? Not, not about the ghost and let's talk about that. Should that be in the show? No, ghost, no. Ghost, his ghost, issue. <laughs> ghosts don't eat chocolate. I said, oh what? How, do you, how many ghosts do you know? He said, Gina, everyone knows. Oh, everyone G does? Gina, everyone knows. <laughs> Like why he said you're you're going to lose your audience at the ghost. I mean, you know, that kind yeah. of I'm I'm tearing my hair out. Are you kidding? That I was crazy. crazy. But I didn't I want this what I I laud myself. I just never get even when my final director, who Michael French, his name is Michael French, he's amazing. He's a great director. And he he when he's looked at me, I mean my last hope, and there's no hope, and there's no show here. Even still, I said, no. And Lillian is a great, people love Lillian. And she's the last 10 minutes of the show. And people love that character. And what's not to love? She's an amazing, she's the teacher we all want, you know, which is not, I love doing her. And that my fellow students said, you got her, you captured her, you know, but, but everyone has had a mother, my mother in the scene, in her scenes, she, one of the things she does is she is furious with me because I'm not, it's called 516. What's 516, Patrick, you might ask? 516 is the number of times she had to pull apart that I put my clothes, my pants in the washer without taking the Kleenex out of my pockets. 
<laughs> and she's there picking out the things, you know, we have a whole scene of her with the Kleenexes, you know, and, and or the dad, my father grew up in Tucson, and he has this wonderful monologue, which the first director hated, which is him saying, you know, it's the moon, it's this whole thing, it's Lonesome Dove was his, and it's this whole thing about Dietz and the moon, and it's this whole thing, and we put a, my music director wrote a, I said, write something that's like, what's it, Aaron Copeland? owed to a common man or something. Mm. And it's this amazing, eternal Western thing. I mean, it's just, gr the sound is, it's, I did, it, and if I had just done Lillian, no one, p people love, you know, the way dad and going back and we were cowboys together, even in the hospital when he had dementia, we were cowboys together, Patrick. We, I got the relationship in one night with my father that I wanted my whole life in his dementia. And that's a song called The Invisible Bone, which people just bust out over in the show, if I can be so bold as to say. I just, I couldn't, I knew, I know. That's why with the podcast now, I just want people to go to my website and listen to it. I don't care about anything. I don't care about numbers or stats or anything. I just know that there are people out there who've lost people, who, who feel like it's over, and there is home and hope inside, always. And that's why I'm passionate about getting this out. Nine, five. I had a wonderful childhood with my parents, but when they died, it seemed everything was gone. Where did I belong? To find myself, I went back into my dreams and memories, into the past that made me who I am. And then there were the cocktail parties in the evening, in the summer, I see us in the living room. They think I'm in bed. So <laughs> long ago. But I'd sit at the top of the stairs and, and look down. Like summer. It was wonderful. On my last day in the house, my house. I wandered through, trying to remember things, trying to memorize everything. But I couldn't find home here anymore. It was like I was never there. I took a train home last night to remember who I am. I took a train home last night to feel like myself again. The truth is, I was alone. And then the part of my brain that wishes me harm, the part of my brain that is not my friend, took over. And she kept at me. And I began to think, was I a good daughter? Did I do enough? Oh, God, I don't know. All right. The 45th District Court in Gina Harris's mind is in session. Will I meet you by the river? Please tell me why.